Our sermon text this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with the first verse. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, I invite you to join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, would it surprise you to hear that many, if not most, of those Old Testament Israelites that Paul was talking about didn't make it to heaven? We get that strong suggestion Because he says that they didn't please God. And you know how you don't please God? It's without faith. God says without faith it's impossible to please God. There were promises already in the Old Testament that they could certainly put their trust in, but instead they grumbled and they fumbled and they worshipped other gods even when they had the Christ right alongside them giving things giving them things like water, like sweet bread from the sky, like bringing them out of Egypt and showing them his power in ten plagues when they didn't even know who the Son of God specifically was in the person of Jesus. He was still there feeding them and showing them the way. Some rabbinic legends say that there was actually a rock that would follow them through the desert those 40 years throughout that wilderness Um, And then he would water them as they needed it. A hint we get like that from the Old Testament is the word Meribah occurs at the beginning and at the end of their wandering. It very well could have been Christ. I'm not sure if that's literally true, that this rock was following the Israelites throughout the wilderness and that was Jesus embodied in, in something rocky. But we can be certain that God gave them so many blessings, this people who were so close to the Lord, who had walked through the Red Sea, who had seen his power through his servant Moses, and who had been brought to the promised land. A lot of them were scattered throughout the desert because they didn't please God. And isn't that astounding? So close, and yet so far. Now, if you know that, or if you have that hint from Scripture, do you think it's possible that God's people now who are so close could possibly be tempted in the same way, could possibly end up rather far from God through the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. 
After all, that's the devil's specialty, isn't it? The sworn enemy of God who would love nothing than revenge, than to get revenge on the true, the one, the good, the holy God. Well, he would also love us to fall in our temptations. He would, he would love to just mess with us. And so that what we're gonna, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to see basically a Sunday school lesson on temptation. And it's God who sincerely wants us to see these things of the past because it turns out that people really aren't so different anymore. And that sinners still fall. And it's in the same ways that are quite common to human beings the world over from generation to generation. So Christian, expect it, respect it, and look to God to escape it. That's why he's talking about temptation. After all, what is temptation? What is it to be tempted? It's when we're in any situation that tries to get us, where the devil tries to get us to deny the faith, or maybe even smaller than that, to sin, um, to, to despair of our salvation, to fear in a way that isn't supported by faith. Any situation where the devil brings us into great and shameful sins. And it's true that temptation isn't quite yet sin. Um, the temptation isn't something that didn't happen to Jesus, and we know Jesus was sinless. Temptation happens to everyone. It's as common as the water we drink and the air that we breathe. But it's when people desire and do what is in the temptation that people become sinners and continue in their sin. And so we can see that temptation is actually a very dangerous thing. It's not something that should be taken lightly, and it's certainly something that is going to happen. Temptation is going to come our way. Make no mistake about it. The devil is going to come and assail us with our own wants and our desires. If the devil was a fisherman and he opened up his tackle box, do you think he'd just have a, a few pieces of bait? Maybe one kind? The devil has many different kinds, every kind you can think of. The devil's tackle box is full of ways that he can lure you into temptation. He would love for nothing less than not just to sink us for a couple of days or keep us away from God for a little while. He wants our eternal souls. He wants that kind of suffering for us because it would be his last effort at getting back at God. He's on a leash, but he does have a little bit of rain to assail us and attack us. So, what's it going to be, Christian? When things are going well, in, in the bright times, what temptations are going to lure you? When things aren't going well, in, in the dark times, how is the devil going to fix his bait and hold it in front of your face? When the grass looks greener on the other side in light of unbelief, what sins are going to tug and pull at you? What things are you going to want to do? I wonder if it wouldn't be a terrible idea to look at your week ahead and write down a list of all the ways that you think the devil may attack you and tempt you and try you. Because that might assist with your battle plan. After all, you can expect it. When you become continuously dissatisfied with God's blessings, what things will you expect? Will it be greed? Will it be hatred? Will it be sinful anger? Will it be coveting something that you want but God hasn't put into your life at this point? Will it be arguments? Will it be strife in the home? Will it be affairs? Will it be other kinds of lies? Will it be domestic abuse? What kinds of temptations assail you? Will it be overconfidence, deception, or doubts? Because if those things attack you, it wouldn't be unusual. After all, Paul said, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God wants you to be ready to watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. It seems like every time that we get what we want, even then our sinful desires rage on and just want a little bit more. So that leads us to our next point. 
when it comes to temptation, God also wants us to respect it. Because of their weakness, Paul gave the Corinthians this incredible gut check. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Paul wanted the Corinthians to take a look and see where they were standing. How about you? Where are you standing? Are you centering your life on his promises? Are you firming yourself up in his word every chance you get? Are you flexing those muscles of prayer? Are you going back to personal daily devotions with your God just to hear what he has to say to you? Or do you like to tread close to the line? Do you like to see how close you can get without sinning, as if it were some kind of accomplishment? Do you like to dance the line a little bit and then point to others and say, look, it's really not that bad. Maybe we can all get this close to the line. It's pretty, it's pretty dangerous to think about what Paul is writing against here. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. It's been said, um, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's a pretty good way to say it, but we would say it much more strongly than standing just for something or standing just on something. It's God's word. It's all of his promises and all that he has done for us. I think sometimes we get the picture that if only we tried harder, we could beat this temptation. Well, tough luck. I didn't do so well because I just wasn't tough enough. And maybe if I try a little bit harder next time, I'll be able to defeat that temptation. I think that's maybe a way that we minimize the temptation that comes our way. If we say, well, I just need to be stronger, all of a sudden we're looking here. And that's exactly where the devil wants us to look. Because here's the real problem, Christians. Our sins start here. When we desire things for ourselves, that's sin. When we carry out the original sin that's been brought on from generation to generation, it's because we're trying to serve ourselves and gratify our own sinful nature. But what, what is a better place to look, you might ask? It's outside yourself. It's to this external, outside person, this greater good, and not just any good, not just any God, but the God who would lay down his own life to deliver us from our sins and to guide us through temptation. Which leads me to my third point. Christian, look to God to escape it. Have you ever heard this line before? God will not give you more than you can handle. It's sort of a viral thing. You see it in a lot of places. I see it most often in novelty stores and maybe knick-knack shops downtown. It's in between the sign that says it's wine o'clock and live, laugh, love, which is not really as bad either, but um, nothing necessarily wrong with those signs, but here's where you won't find God won't give you more than you can handle. You won't find it in the Bible. And what Christians have discovered day in and day out is that God gives me more than I can handle every day. God allows more in my life than than I can muster the strength against day in and day out. And I fall to temptations. And I act out sin. And I'm part of the problem. I need to look to somewhere greater. And so what God actually says is that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, that he'll provide an escape plan. And here are, here are some of our exits. What do you think? How, how does God provide an exit for us? Well, he, he gives us his word. I mean, he gives us everything we need for salvation in one place, in a book, and a lot of us on our phones. What a great place to go. What an exit when it comes to temptation. He's given us a Christian community, a family here at Bethlehem where we can call up a brother or a sister who can assist us through our temptation. A pastor, someone who will give us some weapons to defend against this temptation. He even gives us our own two feet so we can be like Joseph back in the Old Testament. Remember when Joseph was a high steward in in the minister Potiphar's household and Potiphar's wife tempted him to stay with her and do romantical things with her Joseph said, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And he got out of Dodge. He fled. 
he ran away from temptation with her holding his coat in her hands. That's never a bad idea when it comes to temptation. Get out of there. But another one that maybe goes underrated, even though we talk about it all the time, is prayer. In Martin Luther's day, when a local magistrate died, he was kind of renowned for a terrible sinner, fornication, and and things that were kind of well-known that you shouldn't talk about. Uh, Martin Luther's wife said, how can people be so wicked and defile themselves with, with such sin? And Dr. Luther said, ah, Katie, people don't pray. Are you praying day in and day out? What a, defen- a defense we have against temptation, that God allows us to go before him based on grace, not on who we are, not on our works, that we get to approach the Lord of all things and ask our deepest desires, and put forth our smallest as well as our largest requests. Don't forget prayer. And don't forget to whom you pray. This is what the Israelites forgot. They forgot their rock. And maybe, maybe that's one of the most important things for us to look to. No, I'm sure it is. That he's our rock and our redeemer. In this basketball season, when everyone's saying, pass the rock in March Madness, guess what? Christians can do it too. But with more than just a basketball, with the rock of our salvation, the rock who fed the Israelites and gave them water, the rock who feeds us, the rock who was true man and true God, the rock who went in our place and was crucified for our sinful nature and was treated like we should have been, the rock who held up the line when all of us were teasing and tempting and dancing the line of temptation, the rock who pushes us back and says, no, I died for you and because of your sins. That is the rock that we stand on. That's the rock that we pass. And that's the rock who will roll us out of those, salvation, out of those temptations. Don't look to yourself. Know that you're going to face something that's greater than you can bear. Look to the rock to escape it. Look to his baptismal promises. Look to the rock who pieces out his body and blood week in and week out. Pure forgiveness to taste and see. Look to Jesus alone because he alone can bring us through temptation. Amen.